Bonjour, salut, hello, and welcome. And thank you for turning into this afternoon's panel as part of the Word on the Streets Toronto 2021 Festival, our 32nd annual and second fully virtual festival. I'm Sienna, your host, and we are excited to be presenting Illustrating History, Indigenous Stories Past and Present, a discussion of Indigenous stories in the world of graphic novels in partnership with the Toronto Comic Arts Festival. Before we dive into our discussion, we need to recognize the land that we occupy. The Toronto of today exists because of the Toronto Purchase, also known as Treaty 13, signed with the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation in 1805 with a final claim settlement in 2010. Watts Toronto also recognizes the history of the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, the Huron-Wendat, and the Seneca nations in this territory. The place in which Watts operates is the subject of the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, which is an agreement to care for and share the resources around the Great Lakes in peace. Toronto, or Tkaranto, is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples with long histories on this land, and acknowledging this is only the first step in building a practice of land stewardship and indigenous solidarity that honors these peoples. We encourage you to educate yourself about the land that you occupy, wherever it is that you're tuning in from. Just a few announcements before we introduce today's fantastic panelists. I mentioned off the top that this is the second virtual Word on the Street Festival in our 32 year history, and that's not exactly true because this year's celebration also includes four days of in-person author signings at local bookstores starting today. We are at Baca Phoenix Books today and another story bookshop on Sunday. Check out our website or our Instagram Reels page to see the signing schedule for both shops. Don't forget to sign up for our upcoming panels either. This is day two of our 10-day festival celebrating storytelling, ideas, and imagination. Earlier today, we were joined by Jem Hall, Shira Spector, Selena Golding, and Sami Alwani exploring queer stories in graphic novels on our panel, Visual Language in Queer Stories. This morning, Kamal al Saleli and Tamash Dubozi discussed culture and environment in their newest releases. These can be found on our YouTube channel, The Word on the Street. For more information on our upcoming panels, you can visit our website at toronto.thewordonthestreet.ca. If you want to be the first to know about new videos from The Word on the Street, please subscribe to our YouTube channel where you can find all the panels from this year's festival. And if you enjoyed today's talk, please give this video a like to help others find it as well. Now, I am pleased to welcome our moderator for this panel, Molly Swain. Molly Swain is an Odebemsu Isque, or Métis woman, born and raised in Treaty 7 and Métis Nation of Alberta, Region 3 Territory, and currently living in Amiskwatsi Wiskahagan on Treaty 6, MNA Region 4, and Nahiapuat lands. She is a PhD student in the Faculty of Native Studies at the University of Alberta, studying 20th century Métis history and Métis anarchism. She is the co-host of Indigenous Feminist Science Fiction Podcast and Land Back Project, Métis in Space, a co-director of the Métis in Space Land Trust, and a co-founder of Free Lands, Free Peoples, an Indigenous-led, anti-colonial, prairie penal abolition organization. Molly, it is a pleasure to have you here today. Thank you for coming. Oh, thanks so much, Sienna. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. <laughs> I'm going to turn it over to you, and I hope you have a wonderful time discussing with our panelists. Thanks. Sure will. So, Tanse, hello, uh, word on the street folks from beautiful Emasquatsi, Wiskaigan, Edmonton, Alberta. I'm very pleased to be able to join you here today from one of the many, many places, including your own, where Indigenous lifeways and resistance continue to animate the land and peoples of our territories. So what an honor it is today to be able to sit down and visit with two amazing Indigenous authors. I've been a fan of both of their work for years, uh, so I'm pretty excited to introduce you all to them. Uh, we'll start with uh, Katharina Vermette. Katharina is a Métis writer from Treaty 1 territory, the heart of the Métis nation, Winnipeg, Manitoba. Her first book, North End Love Songs, won the Governor General's Literary Award for Poetry, and her novel, The Break, won the Amazon.ca First Novel Award. So I wanted to invite Katharina to read a little from uh, her graphic novel to start us out. Uh, why don't you uh, give it a go? I will give it a go. Thank you, Molly. Um, first of all, I want to do my, my land acknowledgement to acknowledge this, this space here that I am occupying. I'm, I'm coming from Winnipeg. Um, we are Treaty 1 Territory, homeland of the Anishinaabe, Inanu, and Métis people, and Dakota, and Oji Cree, um, which I'm supposed to say a different name for now, but I'm sorry if I forget. I'm going to find that. I also want to acknowledge our beautiful waterways. I always like to include water when I acknowledge my land. Um, my land, the land. Um, 
we have the Red River over here, just a couple houses down from where I'm sitting, and I am always honored to be in her in her place. Um, so thank you for that. I am hoping, I'm really looking forward to our talk today and our time today. And I want to talk a little bit about this graphic novel series that I have been producing over the last few years called A Girl Called Echo. Um, I always find it difficult to read exact excerpts from graphic novels, so I thought I might best use my time just telling you a little bit about Echo and the project and my intentions. Um, Echo was, was born um, about five years ago, just in discussions with my publisher and I uh, at Portage and Maine Highwater Press. I was, uh, I think I was being a, my, putting on my auntie face there and I was giving them heck about not having enough Métis education. They have, of course, published the they were just around that time publishing Chelsea Bell's first book, Indigenous Rights. And I really wanted just an explosion of BT education and historical resources from them. Um, and of course, you know, being good aunties themselves, they just turned this on me and said, well, you're Métis, you can do something, let's go. Um, so talking myself into another project like that, I uh, went back home and went to the inspirational place and I came up with this, um, this girl called Echo, and Echo is a young girl who is set in contemporary times. She's in a very isolated place. She finds herself in a new home, in a new school, and not quite at home in either place. Um, the original tagline of A Girl Called Echo was, Echo is a girl with magical powers. She can read things and they can come alive. So through her school um, and her extra time on her hands as she's, she's so alone, she starts reading about her own history, the Métis history and the, the history of the Métis people. Um, and through that, she's transported back, whether by magic or by some sort of time machine. Uh, she's just transported back into this place 200 years prior where she's on the bison hunt. And she's with this community of people that just embrace her unquestioning because they are her people. And, they, and she has this enormous sense of community in in the work and in, in the the actions of, of being on the bison trail and being amongst those people. Um, what I wanted to do, and that's where we start, that's where we start in volume one in the Pemmican Wars, and it goes through kind of the popular history of, of the Métis people. Um, I wanted to really tackle, this is the next one, volume two, The Red River Resistance. I love that cover. We got the chains from the land uh, surveys happening now on the cover. Echo, by the way, is super cool. She's always listening in the earbuds, on her earbuds to her 90s music because 90s music is the cool stuff. And she has very cool decals on her jacket and her t-shirts. And there's all like, lots of anarchy and nirvana happening in her, in her aesthetic. Um, so I really wanted to talk and explore the different points in Lucy history, of, uh, particularly our resistances and our uprisings. Um, starting in the Pemmican Wars, um, which culminated in the Battle of Seven Oaks, the Red River Resistance, which happened in 1869-1870. Uh, the next one is uh, the Northwest Resilience Resistance, which happened in Batash um, in 1885. And then the final volume that came out earlier this year is um, Road Allowance Era, which is really talking of the diaspora that happened after 1885 and the the search for, the ongoing search for land at home place that the Métis people um, were enduring through the 18, last bits of the 18th century and to the early 1900s. Um, altogether through this story, as much as I wanted to explore all the history, I really wanted to take Echo through and give her a space and home um, as she's doing this very important work of discovering her identity, not only her racial identity, but also her identity as in, in all ways that that might mean something. Um, I really loved, um, Echo really guided me through this. I didn't really have a plan, as I said. I just had my my <laughs> my auntie proving to do while writing this story. So Echo really guided me as she found her family and she found her friends and her people in her modern day and really learned from her history. Um, she, uh, so in the final volume, she really comes into her own, as as I love watching young people do, you know, they just like kind of find where they fit and they find where they where they sync up and they just they, they just come alive. So in this final volume, you can see by the covers, she kind of 
starts off in Pemmican Wars as kind of like this shielded kind of character. And also by the final, she just has a, her arms sprayed wide open and just, you know, showing herself to the world. I also have to say one more, just as I, as I wrap, I have, I take no credit for the amazing visuals that Scott B. Henderson and Donovan Yatsik, who is the illustrator and colorist, respectively. Um, I am not in any way an artist in that way. I just really just come up with the ideas and, and really it's um, a credit to them that she looks so incredibly amazing. Thank you. Yeah, that's actually one of the um, parts of the story that I really loved seeing was Echo sort of going from this very isolated, sort of introverted young uh, person and then sort of through relationality, through learning her history and, and being in contact with her relations, really finding herself and gaining her confidence uh, to move forward with her life. I loved, yeah, I love that. I really, you know, as a young Métis woman, I would have killed to have a graphic novel like this growing up. So I'm really happy it's in the world now. Thank you. I, I feel that way about, um, I feel that way about it too. I feel like this was, the total fantasy piece like you know um i didn't want to waste my gra my graphic novel cred um i wanted to do something totally like pleasurable for myself and for me my fantasy is traveling back in time you know like i want to go talk to louis riel i want to go talk go hang out on bison hunts and um probably not do all the work i don't think i would <laughs> um but i totally like this is my happy place so yeah i love Echo was really what, what would happen to me if I discovered I was a time travel. I'd be so happy. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I do, I, I really think, you know, we're, we're at a place, um, you know, a lot of Indigenous authors, but, uh, you know, sort of speaking as Métis, this is the time for us to, to do that narrative work and do that telling. Um, and we, I think we have some amazing opportunities to tell the stories that we would have loved to hear. Um, yeah. You know, previously, I think, you know, a lot of sort of Métis literature, um, you know, I'm thinking about, you know, Half Breed or April Rain Tree, right, uh, has been very much about um, our dispossession in ways, obviously, that, you know, show our, our strength um, as a nation, uh, but also tend to really focus on um, sort of all of the, all of our loss. And I think that uh, Echo um, does a really good job at, at, you know, talking about the loss, talking about the dispossession, but really foregrounding our resilience and foregrounding our adaptability and our strength as, as mm -hmm. I think, especially Métis women. So... I love that. Um, yeah. Why don't we uh, sort of dive into sort of the, the discussion, the theme? Um, yeah. <laughs> everywhere. We're making yeah. people, we're going to fly off our hands everywhere. So, this, is the, <laughs> this is the magic sparkly hands of transition. Um, so uh, Echo includes, you know, Métis history uh, that is true, but that you fictionalize through your writing. Um, and then also, as you mentioned, the art that really brings them to life and, and the aesthetic. And, you know, I also agree it's absolutely beautiful work. Uh, so what do you think illustration does for these narratives of Métis history? And how do you think that sort of the graphic novel form uh, changes or transforms the way that these narratives are received by the audience? Um, I think they do so much. And I love prose. I'm a big fan of prose. I write in prose and poetry and um, but graphic novels, similar to film, they they can do so much more, or they do it in a different way. I mean, I, I love, you know, just pouring onto pages that are full of words. But I mean, speaking as a writer, my job is infinitely more easy <laughs> when I get to talk with an artist and really just direct what I my the vision that I see. I don't have to describe it. I don't have to, you know, try to capture it in some sort of way. Um, whether it be in prose or poetry, um, I'm really just relying so much on the illustrator to be the heavy lifting here. And and, and Scott, as I said, and I always say, he, he's just a magician when it comes to this. I wanted long shots. I wanted to show prairie, you know, like um, Pemmican Wars in particular opens up to this scene. It's an introduction to this world, which takes place in different time frames, but really it's this entry point of this world of prairie and bison and tall grass and beautiful brown people. Um, so I have these like lush landscapes in mind, right? And I could not do justice. No, 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 I, I, I can 
you know, play with words, but I could not, I, you cannot do justice to the prairie landscape. So, the, so illustration was just able to take that all, all that away from me and just able to show it. I love how I can show it that way. I love that we can use both the words and the dialogue and the, and the illustrations to kind of showcase the world. It really also, I think you can pack so much more story into graphic novels because I was always amazed, like this was my first graphic novel project. Um, and the first draft of the first volume um, was probably originally half of what it ended up being because I was just used to saying story in a, diff in a completely different pace. And when it all came back and this is how we can lay it out and this is how we can, you know, put everything down, I had all these pages to fill and I was just amazed by how much story you can actually pack in. Um, I was also amazed that like when I got some really good street cred with the young people because graphic novels look very cool. I mean, novels yes. are cool, but graphic novels are much cooler. Yeah, no, and I think I, yeah, I absolutely agree. I think, you know, um, Gord's, Gord's book as well really demonstrates sort of how, uh, I guess, dense graphic novels can be in terms of their narrative power. Um, I also just wanted to bring out uh, what you said about um, being able to show the prairie uh, through, through the art. And I think the other thing that um, the graphic novel does really well in terms of scope is it shows, you, you really manage to show the size and the complexity of Métis society which I think really runs counter to a lot of mainstream narratives of who the Métis were, you know, just sort of roving, you know, nomadic bands, small buffalo hunt, right? You show, yeah, you show, you, show, you know, how big the parishes are, the size of the brigades, um, you know, just just the the uh, complexity of, of who we are as peoples, um, you, know, you know, in our dress and um, how we're interacting with one another and everything that's going on, right? It's, it's so vibrant. Uh, and it really is, you know, unless you're reading a fairly in-depth history, it's very difficult to get that sense, I think, just through words. So I thought that that was a really amazing aspect of, of this series for me. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I think that that's also, I feel like that's an illustration thing, too. Because, I mean, you, mm -hmm. you know, there's there's so much you can see all the time. Like, bison hunts were absolutely massive. These are hundreds of families organized somehow um, in a very, like, rid well, rigid is the wrong word, but a very comprehensive legal system um, of laws and how people operated. Like that's that's huge. That's a massive amount of work, and that's a massive amount of people, and all different kinds of people, and all different kinds of ways of being out there on the ferry. Um, and that's just the Biden hunt. Never mind all the resistances and all of the painstaking political movements that happened over the last two hundred years. Like it's, I found it really difficult actually to pare down, um, and that's. Um, I, it was also my first time working in history because I like to make stuff up because it's you know easier and I just have to rely on my imagination. But history is hard. Um, there's so much there, and it's mm -hmm. and I understand some of it's probably just interesting to us geek, but <laughs> but there's so much interesting there. It was so hard to figure out what scene would happen in real life could encompass everything, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, actually, and, and this actually leads into a question that I've really wanted to ask um, ever since I read the, the road allowance um, issue, if you will, or, or volume. Uh, and this is, again, just coming as a Métis history geek is, um, what made you decide to do uh, a volume about the road allowances? Uh, because so many, you know, almost all Métis history sort of of the 19th century ends uh, with the hanging of Riel. And you, yeah. you know, you worked uh, the hanging into this volume and then took it past that. What what made you uh, really want to, to show that part of our history? Well, um, I wanted to do four because I like numbers and I, and I like the number four. Um, so I picked four at the beginning of the project and I really saw it as Pemmican Wars, Resistance One, Resistance Two, um, after like aftermath, it was originally like this aftermath kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, but I really wanted to hone in on this idea of road allowance because I think it was actually a very violent time and also a time of great resistance that happened directly around land and this tangible idea of land and land getting taken away. Um, 
I didn't want to end in 1885 exactly for that reason. I mean, everyone always assumes, you know, it's kind of like this Louis Riel is hanged and then everyone kind of like, you know, walks off into the distance and then, you know, the end music goes and the credits go and like that's, you know, that's a hundred and what, bad math, hundred and like 35 years ago of, of history and stuff that happened really integral and important stuff. Um, I wanted to capture that somehow, also understanding that it's 135 years of a lot of stuff. Um, so I centered in on, and that was really hard because I didn't know where exactly to pinpoint, and I wanted to talk at least in part of the, the recent victories in recent court cases around Daniels and Powley and, and the MMF, and because um, they were very important in my life and in my family's life, so I wanted to kind of end on that high note, because I think they can be at least in part interpreted as a high note. Um, mm -hmm. But also I wanted to talk about the Rhode Islands. I feel like we don't hear enough about the Rhode Islands. And when I originally was talking about the Rhode Islands, so many people even here in Winnipeg, um, even here in Winnipeg, didn't, had no idea what the Rhode Islands was. And you know, the Rhode Islands was all around this city for, for decades um, and all across the prairies. And I can't believe people didn't know about that. And I can't believe, I mean, there, there's actually so much. There's so much that people, I don't think, understand about Métis history. I think they have ideas and inklings and, you know, something about Louis Riel and something about going crazy, but they have no idea of that, actually, all the things that happened, all the myriad of things that happened. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Just that's all that is <laughs> progress. Yeah. No, I think I think that's great, and you know, I really see um, the fourth volume in particular really being an entry point for for people, and I, I hope especially young Métis people to to learn more about our our sort of post real uh, history in that way. Because yeah, I agree. You know, it's uh, and I think you do a really good job of balancing sort of Riel as this important leader and figure, um, but not making him the center of the Métis universe. I think you do like a really incredible job of that because I think that's something that um, continues to be uh, kind of a challenge um, mm -hmm. when we're telling our stories because he has become such a, I guess, almost like a signpost, a symbol of who we are as people. Um, and so you've uh, spoken of this a little bit already, but what would you say uh, has been the most interesting or surprising part about articulating Indigenous history and Métis history through the form of a graphic novel for you? Um. The most interesting, I found it really challenging, and I and I and I say that knowing full well that I had a really good time. I'm I mostly have fun when I'm completely challenged and don't have any idea what I'm doing. Um, I I really love working with other people. <laughs> I I oftentimes I'm right when I'm working I'm not collaborating with others. I'm working all by myself, and I like that too. Um, but I really enjoy collaborating, and I um. And, and Scott and I have done, and, and Donovan and I have done um, these four volumes and also a story called Annie of Red River, which was in uh, the This Place anthology, which was also through Portage of Maine. It's a great anthology for anyone who wants to kind of get a, a gamut of some indigenous stories that aren't as well known. Um, and, and I just really love that process of writing a story and really have my work and the finished product of my work really just being a script that someone mm -hmm. else makes alive. I love that process. Um, one, it makes my job really easy because, you know, at a certain point, I just let it go and he fixes everything. It's wonderful. Um, but I also really love that there's, like, those are some, those are things that I can't do. So mm -hmm. I love, it. and that's why we work with other people because they do things that we can't do. So I really appreciate and love that process. Um, yeah. The history was incredibly difficult. I don't know about you, but I don't. I can't pinpoint favorite point. And like you know, we try to find these points of this was the most important, but that's not true, right? Because they're all such important pieces that all fit together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and I think you know, speaking sort of uh, what you're saying about the collaborative or relational nature of uh, doing this graphic novel work. Um, you know, I think that's where a lot of the most generative storytelling happens. I think especially, you know, for Indigenous peoples, right? Like that's that's how we tell stories. You know, oral history is as much about the storyteller as it is about the audience, yeah. right? And 
uh, you know, so for you working with somebody who has those skills, um, you know, it's, it's really incredible because I'm sure, you know, uh, Scott came up with ideas uh, for how to visualize things that, I mean, I'm, I'm speaking also as like a complete non-artist, like not visual person at all. Um, you know, I can't imagine coming up with the kinds of, of scenes and, and how the, the perspectives and, and how to, to lay those out to tell that story. So yeah, that must have been a, a really invigorating collaborative process, I can imagine. It's lovely. It's like, I, I, you know, if I drew this, it would be stick figures on like, you know, a wavy plane. Um, so it's, it's so beautiful to just say, I want a prairie landscape. I want a crowd of people, you know, it's so wonderful to take, um, I'm thinking of the scene in um, number three in the, during the, the Tosh, um, when they're inside the church, you know, we, we went and we looked at pictures inside the church, because of course the church is still standing, and really making that come alive in a way that um, is impossibly beautiful. Um, mm -hmm. Really just imagining the scenes and where people would be standing and, and things like that. Like it's, it's just great. I have to also say that there's a million, um, not a million, but there's so many resources, so many amazing resources. And I, I found that particularly as I moved along in history, it got more and more exciting because we have so many oral stories around the Tosh in particular and the Northwest resistance and around the road around there. There's some amazing um, oral stories from elders that were really just lovely to read, not lovely because the content was necessarily great, but I'm, I'm just so appreciative of their stories because when you look back at the, like the Pemmican Wars and, and, and even the Red River resistance in a lot of places, we didn't have that. You know, no one was recording those stories. No one was, was taking into account what Métis people were actually thinking and um, knowing about themselves. Mm -hmm. um, I really appreciated having those oral stories to go on for the, other, for the last two volumes. Yeah. Yeah. And I think for, for road allowance, um, especially, I remember thinking that when I was reading it, um, that, you know, again, as, as I hope this inspires more people to learn about the road allowance era, uh, which stretched, you know, well into the 20th century as well. Um, and we're lucky enough, you know, we still have elders who experienced it firsthand, right? We still, we still have people that you can go and sit down with and, and hear those stories one-on-one. -on -one, and that's such a privilege um, to still have that. So I really, I really hope that people um, get excited about that possibility and, and are able to, to reach out and, and hear those stories from their family members or, you know, neighbors or, you know, people in their communities. Mm -hmm. um, because, yeah, I agree, you know, those oral histories, you know, speaking of making things come alive, um, you know, I think a lot of sort of what happens with history is that we, we take all these really vibrant uh, oral narratives and oral histories and, and they get translated into sort of, you know, academic nonfiction and it, it really dries it out, I think, a lot. So <laughs> this this fits the um, oh, it's sorry. Just a version, right? It's just a bit, I wouldn't say dry it out. You know, I can mm -hmm. I can get down with some some good academia intellectual dry articles. Yeah. Or no, not my dry. You could it's just a different way of looking at things. I think. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and there's so much learn there's always mm -hmm. so much. So yeah nothing beats sitting down with an elder um drinking tea and and getting those stories because that's and that's what i found really difficult with so many of the big things right so many of the, these big historical pieces are told um you know kind of like an aerial view it's all everything that was going on and it's so complicated and everyone's name is joseph and um it's so <laughs> to keep everything but then you plan it down to like this really personal story about like um like in red river resistance um i sent on benjamin mm -hmm. um because he is a um a, what do you call it a messenger between the provisional government which is centered at an unoccupied fort, um, Fort Terry. Um, and also he was calling everybody in because the Red River resistance, as fascinating as it is and how many, you know, incredible mythologies that are around it, like, you know, literally out shooting people and whatever. Um, it was actually just a whole bunch of bureaucracy um, <laughs> and a bunch of like petitions. And it's like, you know, actually that pretty much sums up all my history. It's like, let's make a <laughs> Petition, 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 um, <laughs> and another one. 
Um, but no, it, it was all about like bringing people together and getting people collaborating because the whole point was to just say, hey, we in Red River should have some say in how we join Canada. That, that was it. That, that was the resistance. Rather than we're not going to be sold as cattle, we just want to say because we're intellectual beings and we have laws of our own and we want to figure out how to make this work. That was the resistance really kind of anticlimactic um, at the bones of it. Um, but so I love centering on this young man who is just literally going from place to place on this course. Um, Cause you know, horseback riding is so sexy. And <laughs> he went back and forth and I got to go, he went at some point, he went to get um, Henry Prince in the Pegwood um, St. Peter's Reserve. Yeah. Just because the St. Peter's Reserve, like, I mean, I hope, someone very, very soon writes a huge history and graphic novel about St. Peter's because St. Peter's was this huge, profitable, writ, like well-off um, Nishnabe group of people who just absolutely thrived in that place until they were very, very forcibly removed in the early 1900s. Um, so I just wanted to, I couldn't tell that story because um, I was telling this other story, but I just wanted to, you know, he was racing by on his sexy horse and he got to see some farmlands and some good looking brown people farming. Um, that like, you know, I, you can't do that with a, you know, in, in any other form that wouldn't look like cool. Um, mm -hmm. I really appreciate to do that. I have, I have a lot of those like little indulgences that they just let me indulge my history geek. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, it, it felt almost like Easter eggs, you know? Oh. Just those, those little like bonuses. <laughs> I, I love Easter eggs and I actually like it gives me secret pleasure to like put Easter eggs everywhere. Yeah. You know? I mean, even you know, you, you were talking about the um the Church of Batosh and you know, I was just uh thinking about how um you know the Metis uh decided that that church was going to be our fortress, that church was going to protect us, um, and sort of you know, calling on on uh, uh, God to protect the Métis, you know, as, as his people. And, you know, I, I just find that like, <laughs> that interplay so fascinating. Um, so the fact that you you brought that in and, and made it central, um, you know, I think is, I don't know, just personally, I think it's a, a really exciting, for me, it was a little bit of an Easter egg because uh, I've been looking into sort of that church and, and sort of the religious elements of the resistance a little bit more recently and yeah, fascinating stuff. Um, mm -hmm. It is fascinating. I, I and I love it as it's a beautiful structure, you know. Mm -hmm. As a, as a poet, I'm always looking for these symbols that look really pretty. Um, and the church is, and I'm so glad we put it on the cover. And we kind of like it's the center point of that whole resistance. All the meeting places were there. The first place Luriel went when he got there was was to the church, um, or at least in the stories, that's where he did. He probably did something else before him. Maybe went to the bathroom or whatever, I don't know. Um, but <laughs> it's such a beautiful place to center on, you know, and if we're giving things symbols, it's this beautiful, like, um, just place, but yeah, it's such an amazing um, interplay between that spiritual church and, and the Métis people. I think that that is, you know, I could write a whole other four books of just how that played out and why we yes. kept going back there. Like that was like, okay, hello, toxic relationship. Yes. Um, you know, how we like, okay, he, he did, he, he turned on me again, but I'm just, I love the church so much. I'm just gonna go back there. Like it was just really. Um, yeah. Church has not been a good relation. The church people. is generally, I think a really bad, the church has been like, you know, she totally been canceled as a partner a long time ago. Um, <laughs> But yeah, the church and the Métis people is just an, a really interesting interplay of, you know, so many things that I have not even begun to research or understand completely. Yeah. yeah. Um, so maybe maybe just uh, moving forward a little. Um, I was wondering if you could. <laughs> sorry, we just the history thing. I could geek out with you all day about it, honestly. Um, but maybe turning back to sort of the the graphic novel as a, a literary form and uh, as a piece of work, um, what were what did you find were some of the inspirations uh, for your work? Sort of both community you mentioned, you know, oral history, uh, getting to go to a lot of the places that you are sort of writing about and that are depicted, um, 
but you know, what, what, who would you say, or what would you say are your sort of your literary and community relations uh, that generated, helped you to generate this work? Um, so many, and as much as I love graphic novels as a form and have really dove in, um, when I agreed to do a graphic novel, I, I did kind of a reversion of all my favorite graphic novels to just kind of go like, okay, now I got to figure out how to do this. Um, so my graphic novelist, I'm, like my immediate inspirations were were my friend Richard Van Camp and David A. Robertson, who makes an amazing graphic mm -hmm. novel, um, and really like and you know answered my my questions about like, hey, how do you do this? And they're very knowledgeable, and and we we geeked out about comics for a while, um, and that was really fun. I really was interested in the idea of serial, um, so looking at you know even some like Marvel stuff because mm -hmm. it's that idea of like, you have to end with like every like volume has to be its own complete story, but it also has to have this thread that goes through. So it's as much as I had to know each individual story and the history therein, I also had to know the larger thread of the story as much as possible. I mean, I was really discovering it as I went, but I had to leave those threads open, right? You can't just end it all completely. You have to kind of, make a cliffhanger, but you don't want a real cliffhanger because that's annoying and people have to get here. And, um, so you, <laughs> it was really trying to figure out that that rhythm because I mean, graphic novels, particularly serials, have this certain rhythm. Um, and I'm always amazed at how fast they move. Mm -hmm. You know, like I feel like, um, and maybe it's just me, but I read comics really quickly. And, but I'm also, ingesting so much information that people don't understand always always often underestimate this and this is what i always um young people understand this and particularly those who are, are maybe reluctant readers of, of prose books and whatnot because they understand that the visual literacy that you are picking up in a graphic novel is huge it's a huge amount of information that people are really ingesting very very quickly um even if you're not reading it fast, but for some reason I'm always reading it fast for some reason. And I and I retain everything. Like that's the thing, it's an incredibly smooth thing to read. So mm -hmm. um, it was really hard for me to understand how to do that. It's kind of like, you know, I like digging in and picking things apart and figuring out how they're moving. I really did rely on on my um, illustration partners in this place. Um, they both have had have enormous amounts of experience, both in their own work and in others' work. So I really relied on them to um, play, figure out how to play the rhythm because you have to have these full page, page spreads, and then you have to have um, everything has a beat, you know. Like sometimes you have, um, you know, a half page spread. Sometimes you have, you know, all these tiny little pictures all in one, like so many frames. In one mm -hmm. page, and the next page, you're just like dramatically unfolding this, you know, two-page spread just stretch straight out. And sometimes, you know, it's all it's all rhythm and how how that how that plays. Um, and it, it takes a while to learn those pieces of everything. But it's an amazing amount of things that you can doing today. It was so much fun. Um, yeah, I definitely recommend it. I want. I definitely recommend it, particularly as a as a way to talk about history because again I think mm -hmm. that there's so much of that there's so much stuff in history stuff um and the graphic novels contain so much stuff so I think they're a really um great marriage you know yeah very much yeah. the opposite of Native people in the Catholic Church they have a good yeah. <laughs> yeah and I mean I I think uh you know, the graphic novel too, um, it's a really interesting way to make sort of subtle interventions, I think, into historical narratives. Uh, and I think that you make several um, in, in your telling of the, these histories. Uh, and so one of the things that I wanted to sort of bring forward um, uh, to talk about is that um, not only does Echo, uh, as a series, you know, the main character is, is a young Métis woman, um, but I think especially as the series progresses, she's surrounded increasingly by other women, um, older, you know, young, um, as well as, you know, two-spirit and digiqueer people, uh, both in the present day, sort of in the contemporary period, and then when, as she travels to the past. Uh, and then she ends up building a relationship with somebody who turns out to be her several times great-grandmother. 
as she eventually learns. Um, and so I just was wondering if you would speak a little bit to why it was important to you to have these focuses on uh, Indigenous women, Métis women in particular, in the, your work. Um, I think, and maybe this, this is an opinion, but I don't think it's possible to look back on, on anybody's history, but Métis history is the one I know. Um, a little more than others. So I don't think it's possible to look at much of history and not just become enamored with all these women. You know, um, you, you know, again, looking back on the bison hunt, something really basic as, you know, yes, um, and there is new evidence about like, you know, um, I mean, primarily it was men who, who were doing the hunting, but I don't think women were exactly um, not hunted. Um, but I think that in something just as simple as the bison hunt and the Tennyson trade and all of that labor, it was it involved everybody. It involved mm -hmm. everybody all the time. And the leadership that women took from the inception of, of, of Métis culture and Métis people um, is impossible to overstate. It's impossible to ignore. Mm -hmm. um, everything that is on a really basic, and I don't necessarily like, yeah, maybe I can say this, maybe I can explain it, but on a very basic level, everything that's indigenous about Métis is from a female perspective, it's from the mothers that were from these original people who were, you know, European fathers and indigenous mothers, and then became, um, though Métis culture is much, much more than that, and over, over many, many generations, so I never like to kind of boil it down to that, because people, mm -hmm. um, because it's so much more. Um, but everything that is indigenous is from that female perspective. All of that strength and all of those um, those ways of being and those lessons and those teachings were, were women. You know, they were um, making the pemmican. That was something that women were doing. You know, all of those the farming was was something women were doing. As as many indigenous women were farmers for for generations before Métis people became Métis people. Um, it's, it's a, I don't think that you can, I mean, you can talk about Luriel and Gabrielle Jamal and all the main kind of guys who are fascinating and lovely and I love them and, you know, we're homies. Um, but all of those backbones were women. Mm -hmm. Everything behind them were, were, was women and, and all of that work and men and, and the entire community. Like it was something that was, um, that it, all of these things were things that everyone was involved in. These resistances were not just young men fighting each other on some battlefield far away. They were in the homes and the villages and the people around them and everyone was involved and everyone was also at risk. Um, mm -hmm. And everyone was affected, you know, from the Red River resistance, definitely at Batash, women were all right in, in the middle of everything at Batash um, and through to the Road Allowance era where everyone was forced out of their homes. Um, it wasn't something that just happened to one part of the population. Everybody was involved and everybody was finding ways of being around all of that. Um, mm -hmm. I uh, I also like, you know, and again, looking at visuals of everything, I really wanted to give lots of, of these rich visuals around the beadwork, which is all women. And all of that cultural material culture that, that was around from octopus bags to beaded jackets to, again, the sexy horses and their sexy um, saddles. Um, all of that was, was women-made things mm -hmm. and contributions. Um, though I, I, I'm sure men also were fabulous beaters because as, as I've heard that there are actually many men who were beaters also, but I'm pretty sure they were all taught by their mom. Okay. Um, <laughs> Again, women, it's all women. It's mm -hmm. impossible to take, away, take that away, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, no, that's great. And, you know, I think there's been so much really good work, I think, especially in the past 10 or so years about sort of rereading women into painting history. Um, and so I think, you know, uh, the series is, it very much takes up that, that legacy um, and, and is an incredible contribution to sort of reimagining, I think, the the stereotypical narrative of, of who we were, especially as 19th century peoples, or 19th century people, I should say. Um, so I 
think we are getting into the question period time. Uh, would, yes. Can I just add to that just because none yet. So, okay. I, can I just add to that just because yeah, um, absolutely. Geeking out. Um, there's so much exciting work happening in Métis history and in, in history in general. I, I, I kind of love history um, from certain vantage points in particular. I'm, I'm really fascinated and great in that. Um, but Métis history, there's so many amazing works coming out. And I'm, I'm, I'm talking about um, Brenda McDonald. I'm talking about um, Chelsea Vowell. I'm talking about, oh, there's a beautiful book. I'm not going to remember the author. It was called The People That Own Themselves. Mm -hmm. um, when I was reading, um, of course, The Northwest is My Mother um, by Jean Tellet, who I actually, it came out in between the second and third volume, and I actually used it um, and cited it in several points through the third and fourth volumes, because it is literally the book, um, it's a popular history of, of the Métis people, and it was literally this book that I felt like I've been reading for my entire life. It's just everything all kind of like synopsized in one place. It was so beautiful. Um, there's mm -hmm. so much incredible work being done, not only centering women in this history, but also by Métis women who are yes. bringing yes. this forward. I love this work. And you were, of course, very much a part of that. You're going to do such amazing things. And next time you do a book talk, it's going to be your interview. <laughs> <laughs> like me. <laughs> Thank you. I'll, I'll try to take that optimism with me <laughs> put it to work. Yeah. Uh, but I understand PhD work is not always that optimistic but <laughs> yeah. yeah I mean you, you you're writing about sexy horses my work feels <laughs> a little less sexy I'll, I'll try to bring that energy in um but yeah no I, I absolutely agree you know reading I think especially for me uh you know, like Brenda McDougall Jennifer Daisy you know I think Brenda in particular has you know reading reading you know any of her work it's it's such a an absolute brainwave um just the way that she looks at history the way that she interacts with the archive um just does you know, incredible things. She, she's able to almost like flip a lot of these narratives right on their head uh, when it comes to, I think, particularly uh, Métis women, but then also how Métis society was actually organized, um, you know, who actually uh, sort of inst almost installed Louis Riel sort of as this leader, as this mobilizing figure, right? It was it was Métis women uh, doing this political leadership work. And, um, and she, you know, finds all that out through the archives, who's related to who, who's moving where, uh, and just yeah really really amazing amazing stuff um that's happening and you know not of course not just not just brenda um but i do tend to fangirl brenda a little bit um i so. have a brenda story oh, oh, oh sorry. no no I, i'd love to hear it while we're waiting um uh, um because there's no questions yet that's why i was saying. um and please if you have any questions please please ask them that would be yeah. absolutely lovely i love questions and answer almost anything um my Brenda story is she actually emailed me um, about a year ago, um, and I was I was so excited to get her email. I was like, "Oh my God, there she is!" And she freaking fact checked a typo that was in volume two, and I was mortified. And what oh, this was, no. it, was a, it was a date that I had gotten wrong. It was supposed to be, mm -hmm. um, I'm going to get this wrong because I'm thinking about this, but it was supposed to be like June 24th and I had written July 21st um, and it freaking went to print and it got through the fact checkers and the history and all the people that, that read it after I, I'm very messy. So I have lots of people who check things after um, and somehow got all the way through and got to print and tell Brenda McDougall calls or emails me up and says, what's this date? I don't understand the significance of this date. I was mortified. My only defense is that I put that draft in um, right after I had a baby. So my mm -hmm. brain was probably mush. That's my defense. But really, I just, I just, you know, got a, a typo the date wrong and it didn't, and it got all the way through. And we, we luckily fixed it. So if you have an early version of volume two, it has the wrong date and then it's since been corrected in later printings. Um, and she was very, very nice about it and very kind and um, just, yeah. Um, so that's my story about, you know, and I love that. And I love that about historians because I learned so much. <laughs> yeah. I would make a horrible historian because I'm just always going after, you know, the sexy thing and the flashy thing. And I'm like, oh, I want to just talk about the horse and riding on on the horse. And I forget, you know, oh, yeah, I'm supposed to fact check things. <laughs> Oh yeah, yeah. put the dates on things. So I'm actually really bad about that. 
but um, that's my Brenda story. So I'm it's not my strong suit either. I was schooled. Talk about antiness. I was totally schooled. Yeah, I mean, you know, I think that's the danger of history, right? Is you put it out there and historians are going to read it. And, yeah. <laughs> but no, I, I love that. And I, I also kind of, I love the idea of maybe those early printings of volume two are, are going to become collector's items, you know, like okay. or, or misprints or, or. It's like, what the hell is this date? It makes no sense. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's true. Oh, it's right. That was something that really surprised me about history. And this is coming in naive. I never took, I took a couple like indigenous history classes in university, but I was by no means um, extensive in my historic knowledge. I, so, and that's part of the reason why I wanted to do this project. I wanted to dive in. I wanted to learn all these things. I, I felt I knew everything in pieces from my dad and my uncles who were always like, you know, kind of politically minded and really loved this story. Um, when my, my uncle died, he um, gave me all his, um, old Louis Riel books, you know, typical oh, me cool. guy. Every single yeah. Louis Riel book that was ever published, <laughs> he bought it. And they're all just racist pieces of garbage, like, you know, <laughs> yeah. the 1800s. Um, but he loved them, you know, because mm -hmm. he was this guy, Louis Riel. Um, so I felt like I knew pieces, but I wanted to know everything. And I wanted to just dive in and really you know, understand. Um, and I was actually really surprised and maybe naively so that history isn't as set in stone as you think it is. It actually mm -hmm. is totally and completely, you know, reliant on who is consuming it, who is looking at it. Because what I see in history is not necessarily what, you know, some scholar from Ottawa saw in like the 1800s or something. I think it's a completely different vantage point. And I think that's really interesting when we think about history and, and new interpretations of history. Mm -hmm. um, how it's still changing, remarkably so. You know, it's not just in the past in any way. I kind of love that. And, and it's very telling, but. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I mean, I also love, you know, I think we're at this sort of incredible moment in time where, you know, back in the day, our communities, you know, would have all been together and collectively forming these histories, collectively deciding on these narratives. And of course, you know, that's where a lot of oral history comes in um, that we can access today. But, you know, we're sort of, we're almost returning to that point where we're able to have these really big collective conversations. And, you know, it's it's folks like yourself and, and the other folks doing, you know, uh, this place and, and that kind of, you know, you're sort of almost like the public figures um, who are who are able to sort of be the mediators of, of these new interpretations and forward new things and, uh, you know, see if they, they stick and they resonate with people or, you know, people want to come back and, you know, give a counter narrative or, or whatever it is, right? Like we're able to have these sort of really big collective conversations again, you know, through social media and, you know, even through events like this. Um, which I think is amazing, right? This is sort of another, both a new and an old form of, of relationality for how we determine our our collective understanding of our history, which is fabulous. And, you know, there's never gonna be one thing that we all agree on, right? If, if there's anything that is true about Métis is that, you know, <laughs> they're not like herding cats, but. <laughs> herding feral cats who are yeah. angry yeah. and hungry. <laughs> yeah, totally. and yeah. There's claws everywhere. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's Macy opinions are like, <laughs> yeah. it's true. And I love that. And I love that idea of, um, I think it's it's all like that. I mean, and, and it's all like, literature is really just all of us talking to one another and talking mm -hmm. to the reader and talking to, or the audience or the, the um, in graphic novels, it's the reader, but it's also like the audience in a lot of ways. Um, this person who's watching everything unfold but it's really just this constant conversation that we're having with whoever is consuming the work and also whoever else is making work. You know, I think that, um, you know, I wouldn't be here, I wouldn't be doing any of this without Maria Campbell or without Beatrice Collins and Monsignor and without Lee Miracle or any of the other great aunties who came before and, and you know, really made a way for, for people, mm -hmm. the rest of us to come come forward and make these stories. and as as painful as those narratives were sometimes, I think they were very necessary in the beginning of the understanding of who we are as Métis people. Um, numerical, not being Métis, but the other two were, are, <laughs> very much are, I think. Um, but I think it's really just this ongoing conversation. You know, I think mm -hmm. that I really started writing 
um, because I read those those books and because I saw something of myself in the, in the world, in, in the world of books, and not only knew that I could do it, but also knew that maybe I had something to add. Um, mm -hmm. And it was a little bit of, um, you know, it's just a little bit of this huge conversation. Um, yeah. And I think there's plenty of room for like so many voices to just add to this conversation. And I, and I love that as a, you know, we're on, we're, we're still talking. We're just talking around as we've always done. Mm -hmm. and, uh, yeah, I like that. Like an image. Yeah. All just around this great big fire that is the computer. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, totally. Yeah, we've got our, our virtual tea and you yep. know, somebody's somebody's passing some kind of delicious digital soup around or, you know, what have you. And yeah. There's, yeah, cookies. That's... There's cookies in my computer all the time. <laughs> there go. Yeah, no, I love that. And I think that's a, a beautiful place to close out. Oh, we have a question. That's great. Uh, so the question is, what age do you recommend kids start reading your graphic novels? Well, these graphic novels in particular were designed for middle years. So that kind of starts somewhere around grade five and six, which is 10, 11, 12, then. Um, I think those are, those are always numbers that, you know, educators and publishers put together. Um, because you know, kids always uh, fully understanding. Kids always want to read things that are a little too old for them, mm -hmm. um, whenever possible. Um, so that's kind of where it starts. But I think, you know, when I think there's so much that can be gained even before when people are kids are reluctant readers or before they necessarily can read, you can still get so much out of the, the pictures. Um, so I mean, that that would be my official recommendation. <laughs> but I mean. Um, let me see. And we're not really totally, I guess, as far as graphic goes. I mean, this is a pretty difficult history in some places, but I don't know that we're necessarily graphic in a lot of places. I tried to keep a lot of the that stuff off scene mm -hmm. possible, though I do think the reality of calling history and is that there was guns and blood and a whole bunch of things that aren't really great and comfortable. So I'm talking myself into a corner. 10, 11, 12, you know. Yeah. Depending on how much, you know, how many violent video games the kid has seen. I don't know. Yeah. And I mean, yeah, I, th I think about some of the, uh, the kid, like, children's media that, you know, I grew up with, sort of, you know, or thinking back to, you know, 70s, 80s, 90s children's media. Some of it's, like, terrifying. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh, yes. And just, like, blood everywhere. Always, like, ketchup stains all over the place. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. But that's all eighties. Just catch up stained blood stains all over the place. Yeah, somebody's just slightly off scene, just like squeezing the Heinz bottle as hard <laughs> as they can. There, there. Kids entertainment. Saturday morning cartoon. Yeah. Yeah. And there we are plunked in front of the TV, like, yeah. <laughs> More violence, please. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't think my graphic novels are not violent. Well, no, I actually I mean, I, I think you definitely do show some some fairly, um, you know, there's some some intense stuff, you know, I think especially, you know, the road allowance when the, the community on fire and stuff that can be scary. But, you know, I think you also deal with the violent aspects um, with a lot of sensitivity. I'm thinking especially um, of when you are showing the hanging of, of Riel and Echo is there and watching it and sort of the way that the panels play out, I thought was um, really good and did not feel exploitative at all. Uh, so... Yeah, I think I think you made some. I'm sure that was a very deliberate choice on your part. Um, but yeah, no, I, I appreciated that because I think, you know, that is that can be uh, something that's sort of shocking and and almost titillating in a way that can be exploitative. And I think that you you really navigated that well. So appreciate okay. that. I, I thank you. Um, I'm always conscious of that, and I hope I do it well because I mean we're talking about graphic novels here, but I tend to write a lot about difficult things. Mm -hmm. um, in all my work, um, and I don't know if that is, I don't, there, there's many reasons for that, but I really always try to approach things as sensitively as possible. I think that we have, there's a certain amount of truth telling that has to happen, like we have to say mm -hmm. how it went. It wasn't sunshine and roses. They were not just hurling flowers at us. 
um, you know, there was a certain amount of realism that real part of the story that's very difficult to hear that is also necessary for Derek to fully understand um, mm -hmm. the devastation. But also I think there's a way to tell that, you know, with, with care, mm -hmm. you know, I try to be as careful as I, as I can with everything. Um, <laughs> Will's talking about trauma all the time. Um, yeah. <laughs> Go figure. Maybe that's all. But I think that's also a bit of a mid shift thing. We're kind of like, um, <laughs> we kind of, you know, we talk about really horrible things and then we make a joke. You know, yeah. that's general indigenous thing also. Like, I don't know um, why we do that, I think, but it, it is, you know, helped us survive and we've mm -hmm. survived. So I feel like that. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I wish I had a great joke now to end off this conversation. <laughs> But uh, I will just say, hi, I thank you so much uh, for this uh, discussion today. It was absolutely wonderful having a chance to speak with you. Um, and uh, I hope uh, you have a great day and rest of the festival. And I will pass us back to Sienna. Hey, both. Thank you both so much. This is a delightful conversation. I learned a lot, uh, including like reframing my view of history to think of horseback riding as a sexy thing. Thank you for that. <laughs> that was great. <laughs> but in general, yeah, thank you for, for giving us this beautiful, colorful tour of, of Métis history and being able to really walk people into it because it's, it's fascinating stuff. Thank you both for this chat today. And thank you for everybody who is tuning in from home. It has been a joy to sit with you. We're only sorry to miss the participation of author Gord Hill, though we hope we can welcome him to Watts another time. If you'd like to purchase a copy of the books discussed in today's panel, please visit our official bookseller for this event, Page and Panel, the TCAF shop, or our official ebook and audiobook sponsor, Rakuten Kobo. You have until the final day of the festival to sign up for our giveaway in partnership with Rakuten Kobo. You can visit toronto.thewordonthestreet.ca slash 2021-festival-contest for your chance to win one of three special prizes, including a new Kobo e-reader. Remember, for each day of the festival that you tune in, we'll announce one bonus entry code. Today's bonus entry code is Illustrate. If you're interested in a more hands-on festival experience, consider signing up for our workshops. At 4 p.m., that's right now, Brian McLaughlin is leading a fun walkthrough of his newest RPG-based graphic novel, Complete the Quest, The Poisonous Library. And at 6 p.m., we'll be joined by Greg Santos, who will be running an interactive workshop focused on the playful nature of poetry. We'll be back tomorrow starting at 10 a.m. with our panel in conversation with Anosh Irani and John Krezank, presented in partnership with Diaspora Dialogues. For more information about this year's lineup, as well as the panelists that you've been listening to today, please visit our website at toronto.thewordonthestreet.ca. If you'd like to support The Word on the Street by making a donation, simply head to our website and click the Donate Now button at the top of the homepage. Thank you so much for joining us and have a wonderful rest of your day.